From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Here's what's coming up. K-State's Greg Ibendahl will discuss his new analysis of debt trends on Kansas farms based on over 45 years of data. He compared the debt-to-asset ratios over those years to the most recent ratio as an indicator of farm solvency. Then K-State's Mike Stom will provide a scouting report on canola stands in Kansas. He'll be talking about canola durability and advances in canola variety and hybrid development at two field days here in Kansas later this week. And on this week's edition of Milk Lines, K-State's Mike Brook advises you dairy producers to keep an eye on your alfalfa stands for signs of accelerated insect activity. All that here on Agriculture Today. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we're glad to have you along. This is our Tuesday edition. New information pulled together that's of importance to you agricultural producers out of agricultural economics at K-State. Our guest has done a fresh analysis of debt levels on Kansas farms through Kansas Farm Management Association data and looking at extensive years of that data. Greg Ibendahl is a farm management economist with K-State Research and Extension. He's the one who authored this particular work now on the agmanager.info website. Why debt is a topic of the moment here. We've looked at the economics of the day in farming and ranching. They're, They're pretty decent, one would say. So why are you bringing this up now, Greg? Well, you know, really debt is one of those key aspects you have to have to really be a farm because there's there's so much capital involved, so many assets involved, that really for a farm to provide all their assets on their own is really almost impossible. So really, any farm practically is going to have debt, especially those farms who are more toward the start of the farming thing. And really, you should probably think of your lender really as your second partner in, in your farm operation because, you know, we have assets on a farm and there's really two ways to own those assets. One, you, you can own them yourself, which would be the equity side of things. And the other side is you have a lender providing you some debt capital. So again, most farms are going to have debt and you really should think of debt as a key aspect and your lender is a key partner in your business here. And, uh, you know, having a appropriate level amount of debt to your farm is kind of a key thing right now. Uh, hasn't been too much of a factor with the way interest rates have been, but that could very easily change. And we have seen periods in time where, you know, too much debt has gotten you in trouble. You bet. You have to think only back to the 1980s to point that out. The yardstick of choice here is that calculation known as the debt to asset ratio. And you've noted that that is at a rather historically low level right now. Well, it is. And really, you know, if you're going to go in for a loan with your lender, that's probably the very first ratio they're going to look at. There's several reasons for that. You know, a lot, a lot of really before the farm crisis back in the 80s, looking at your debt to asset ratio was really the main thing lenders were looking at. You know, the lenders want to make sure they were going to be covered in case there was a problem. So as long as you didn't have too much debt relative to your assets you put up for the loan, you know, they were fine with that. And again, lenders are they're they're pretty particular about that. They're going to look at that number pretty closely, uh, and that's that's good information to have because they actually have very strong numbers as far as the quality and the information that goes into that. You know, most lenders are going to know just looking at their loan portfolio to you as a farmer. They're going to know what the debt levels are, and they're going to know what your assets are pretty easy. So that's a pretty easy ratio for farmers and lenders to calculate. And again, that's the first thing they're going to look at. They're going to take your the amount of debt that you have, which goes in the top of that uh, ratio calculation. They're going going to look at the amount of assets you have, and then we get a number for what we call the debt-to-asset ratio, and that's the percent of your business. You can think of that as the percent that your lender actually owns, whereas your equity-asset ratio, which is kind of the flip side of the debt-to-asset ratio, that's the percent that you own is that equity-to-asset ratio. And as that number reads, the lower, the better. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I, th- I would think so. Certainly, your lenders don't want to own too much of your business, so they want to keep that number fairly low, and you as a farmer want to keep the, the amount that your lender actually has control of your business kind of low, too. So, again, we're looking for lower debt-to-asset ratios, the better. You wanted, though, in this effort that's now on agmanager.info, to look a little closer at historical trends with a debt-to-asset ratio. Currently, it looks very good. 
So why worry about this, and what prompted you to explore this further? Yeah, that's that's one of the things I think may have gotten us in trouble during the 1980 farm crisis was if you're just looking strictly at the debt-to-asset ratio, those look very good at the time, and we're kind of seeing the same situation now. If you, in fact, if you look at our debt-to-asset ratios over time, and we have I have data in, the, in this publication that goes back to the uh, early 70s as far as what those numbers actually are. Really, at, at the debt-to-asset ratio, we're probably at one of the low points during that entire history that we have computerized farm records. In fact, we really are at, at really at a low point, uh, at least for two of the regions in the state, with a debt-to-asset ratio of about 20 percent, which is really, really good when you look at historical numbers, not only for Kansas, but really across the U.S. That said, assets are at historical highs, and debt is also at a historical high. And you think it's important that that relationship be understood here when analyzing really where producers stand? Yeah, because if you go back and look at this, you know, 20 percent debt to asset ratio, which is really, really good. It was also pretty good right before the 1980 farm crisis. We go back to like 1976 and the debt to asset ratios there were probably about 25 percent. So, again, you know, very good numbers. But really that ratio can hide a lot of things that farmers need to be aware of. So, you know, again, there's two ways you can make that number change. Uh, One of them is you can take on more debt. That will certainly uh, increase your debt-to-asset ratio. But the flip side of that is your debt-to-asset ratio can go down if your assets appreciate a lot in value. And we have certainly seen that over the last several years where land prices have gone up quite a bit. So even though you may keep your debt levels where they are, maybe even add more debt, your debt-to-asset ratio can go down just because your value of your assets have increased. So if something would happen to asset values, that's where one could get into trouble. That's your point? Yes, that is the case here. So what happened during the 1980 farm crisis, you know, farmers did take on a lot of debt. I think that's if you're looking at, and again, I'm kind of working on an article looking at comparisons between now and the 1980 farm crisis. We're certainly not there yet, but there are starting to be more and more similarities. You know, one of the key things there that happened, you know, farmers did take on more debt. They took on a lot more debt than what we're really seeing now. But the asset ratio is appreciated so much higher than what they are now, too, that that it made the debt-to-asset ratio look really good. So we're seeing a situation now where, you know, farmers have taken on some debt over the last 10 years, uh, probably the western region more than the other other two regions. So we're seeing debt go up some, uh, you know, not like it was back in the 1980s, early 1980s. But what makes this ratio have been going down over the last 10 or 20 years is the fact that land prices have increased faster than farmers have taken on debt. So the thing we worry about, well, what would happen if we did have a, a situation where commodity prices would crash and land values came down? What would happen to our debt-to-asset ratios? And I think the you know the thing we're not really watching for is you know a big drop in land values could bring that make that debt to asset ratio go back up really high again. Mm-hmm. You mentioned it just a second ago there, Greg, and that is that there are regional differences in Kansas. The debt to asset ratios and Western Kansas has been carrying higher debt of late. Yeah, I, I have one figure in my publication looking at the debt per crop acre, and again that's looking at both owned acres and the rented acres. And we have seen a steady increase in the debt per crop acre, really across all three regions, probably more in the western region than than the other two. But really since about 1980, that that farm debt per crop acre has steadily climbed. It went from about 150 or so back in the 1990s to where we're right now at a case where we're looking at a debt per crop acre, probably about you know, three to four hundred dollars per acre here. So again, a steady increase in debt, which has uh, again being hidden by the fact that land values have gone up even more than that. But if we just look at this on a regional basis, we see that uh, while maybe the eastern and central parts of the state have maybe kind of held steady with their debt, they've certainly had a little bit. It seems like a western Kansas has really increased their debt numbers more than what the other two regions have. And they normally, you say, track pretty closely together. Yeah, they do. And I'm a little surprised to see that big disparity now between the eastern and uh, central versus western Kansas, where we've seen the western Kansas farms take on a lot more debt, whereas eastern and, and central have kind of stayed steady or maybe just increased their debt slowly here. So I'm not really quite sure how to explain that. I don't know if that's an indication that maybe things are a little rougher out west. I always, I always have the the idea that, you know, western Kansas is almost like the canary in the coal mine when it, when it comes to farm problems in the state, that to me, they seem like they show up there first before they really show up in the rest of the state. Well, what producers should be watching then? The question comes up, could they possibly, given the state of the economics right now looking so favorable, could they still become overextended? If land values don't fall, are they still okay? 
Well, you know, that's an interesting question because, you know, this is probably going to be our eighth year in a row now of increasing net farm income from the previous year. So right now, you know, net farm income is at record levels. And if a lender just goes back and does balance sheet lending and looking at what their debt levels are versus what their asset values are, I don't think a lender would have any trouble at all loaning a farmer more money. And, and uh, you know, farmers taking in more debt, as long as interest rates are low, it's almost like the federal government. You know, it's, that, that's not that big of a deal when interest rates are, are low that you can hand, really handle a lot of debt. The problem happens, like we saw in the 80s, is what happens if we start to see a lot of inflation, a lot of higher interest rates, then suddenly your interest expense becomes a bigger issue and debt becomes becomes a little harder to service. So again, right now with, with interest rates being low, it's probably probably not that big of a deal. But again, I think we're looking at a period coming up here with higher inflation and uh, higher levels of interest rates that you're probably going to see the interest expense number probably start to jump up quite a bit. And then, you know, too much debt's going to be a, a problem for farmers. Yeah. That is the elephant in the room, isn't it? What yeah. may happen with interest rates going forward and whether inflation can be reined in. Yeah, that's going to make it more and more like the 1980s. Again, I see a lot of similarities between now and then. I don't want to, you know, panic anybody. I think we're on the verge of that happening. But, you know, we're seeing things of, of higher uh, appreciating land values. We're seeing debt levels go up. We're seeing higher inflation, higher interest rates. We're seeing really good net farm income. Really, the, the piece of the puzzle we haven't seen is suddenly a big drop-off in commodity prices to some type of recession that really puts things in the dumper as far as the farm economy is concerned. So that hasn't happened yet, but I, that's something farmers need to keep on the radar that, you know, that's not out of the range of happening again. That's your purpose in sharing this information, and it's captured nicely in an article that Greg authored, again, at the agmanager.info website as we speak. It's entitled Debt Levels of KFMA Farms. He ran an analysis of farms with the Kansas Farm Management Association, looking at data from 1974 through 2020. It's a good read. Lend some insight to this, agmanager.info. Greg, thank you. Good work, as always. All right, thanks. Farm management economist, K-State Research and Extension, that's Greg Ibendahl. We'll be back with more for you. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Agriculture Today is back now. In the spotlight on this segment, canola and the state of that crop in Kansas. As we're moving into the latter part of the spring now and soon into the summer finish for those canola stands out there. Mike Stom is a canola agronomist with K-State, and he's Mike's side with us now, not only to talk about how canola is doing currently, but to preview two field days coming up in South Central Kansas for you canola producers. Mike, take us back to last fall, the planting of the crop, and then how it overwintered. How did it come through? I think overall, Eric, based on the conditions that we had this winter, I I think the crop came through really well. Now, we've certainly had some challenges along the way, and I can think of two things, uh, particularly for this uh, this winter that we just came through. The first being the, the drought conditions. They didn't do us any favors in terms of aiding survival. We certainly needed the rain that we received this past week, so I'm real thankful to see that. Uh, but this past year... We had a lot of up and down temperatures, you could say. Uh, oftentimes we had lows dropping into the single digits, and then we'd rebound and be normal temperatures for a while, and then we'd drop back down to the single digits. And uh, just looking over that the last uh, several months, we saw that kind of repeatedly uh, through 2022. Well, that resulted in a loss of our above ground biomass. And when we think about canola and yield, the amount of leaf area that you have kind of over winter really kind of coincides with your yield potential at the end of the season. Mm -hmm. So in these years where we have these fluctuating temperatures and we lose that leaf area over the winter, we can oftentimes see lower yield potential than in the spring. In the years where we maintain that biomass, we typically have higher yield potential. So this year's crop, we saw that removal of the above-ground biomass, and thus we think yield potential may be a little bit less. But, of course, with the rain that we had, hopefully we'll see some rebound in the crop. It's not to be written off. This crop can come back even though that cover was a little spare through the winter. Yeah, that's right. We definitely don't want to write it off at this point. Uh, now is probably a really good time to get out and, and look again at the crop and just kind of see how the recovery is going. We know that canola is indeterminate, and so it's got numerous growing points uh, on the plant. 
And so it could rejuvenate some of those growing points on on the plants and so produce more buds, which will flower then and produce uh, viable pods. If, if that occurs, then, uh, yeah, we should definitely see some recovery in the crop. Is it time-wise, though, behind the curve a bit, Mike, as we think about canola eventually maturing into maybe even hotter conditions than it normally would? We are a little bit behind in what we would, where we would typically be for this time of year. Thinking about these upcoming field days that we have, uh, last year we were in full pod fill. There weren't any flowers in the fields, uh, so to speak. Uh, this year we're going to be in that situation where we're kind of half bloom, half pod fill. So I would say we're probably a week to 10 days behind where we would typically be. Um, But with the heat that we're having currently, I think we're probably going to catch up uh, somewhat with the moisture that we've had. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see how the crop goes ahead and and fills out. So I definitely wouldn't write it off, especially if you received uh, some moisture here this past week. Uh, I think we'll we'll probably see some recovery. If moisture is a little on the thin side for the next three to four weeks, though, worrisome? Potentially. You know, we're at that time where... Uh, winter canola is at its peak water demand, so this is when we really need to have uh, soil moisture available to go ahead and fill. You know, if we can get through the next couple of weeks and get into full pod fill and things start to dry out then, I'm probably not uh, as worried. If we didn't have this this rain this past week, I'd, I'd really be worried, but that, that certainly helped the crop that's out there because most of the canola-growing region in the state received at least some moisture, and all of our research plots received uh, adequate moisture. So I'm pretty optimistic about it. We'll get into this as we detail these field days, but is this the kind of growing season that helps you as a canola breeder sift through the varieties that you're working on and evaluate their durability, for instance? Yeah, it really can. We need a good balance of the really good years, uh, like we had last year, and then these years where we see more stress. So, you know, one of the things that I've been able to rate really well this year was the recovery from this loss of biomass that we had. So you could basically go through all of our research plots and rate all the experimental varieties for their their spring vigor. So that's going to be an important note this year. We want to see which of those varieties were able to recover from uh, the loss of the biomass and then also kind of maintain their their growth through these stressed conditions. So that'll be really important information, I think, uh, moving forward. We'll also have a good indication on on winter survival, too, as well, because uh, some of the locations we had, we did see some differential winter kill in the varieties. And so that note is always important to us as well. Um, and then with the rain that we've had and the ultimate recovery of the uh, varieties, uh, yeah, we should be able to make some strides in being able to maybe identify some things that have better stress tolerance than uh, what we commercially have available now. Some of the things that you'll be covering at these field days, which will take place in adjacent counties, Kingman and Sumner counties, South Central Kansas, same day though, this coming Thursday, May the 12th, and let's take them one at a time. Kingman County site near Norwich, what do you hope to share with growers attending there? Here at the Norwich uh, site, we'll have uh, the National Winter Canola Variety Trial. So within that trial, uh, we'll have a group of what we call open-pollinated cultivars and then hybrids. And so we'll talk about both those different types of of varieties, and and most canola growers are are familiar with uh, open-pollinated varieties and and hybrids. Uh, So we'll cover those topics on the OP side of things. There are several commercial varieties now that are available that were developed by our breeding program. So we'll go through and talk about uh, specific varieties in those in that trial and talk about their different characteristics. And, you know, we've got a range of, of characteristics in the material that we've released and then licensed now. So we have conventional varieties. We have Roundup Ready varieties. Uh, we have varieties that are high oil producing. We have varieties that have just exceptional winter hardiness. And so we'll talk about those individual traits of those uh, varieties. In addition to the National Winter Canola Variety Trial at the Norwich site, we also have a hybrid trial that's made up of materials that have uh, half of their parentage developed by K-State, so the the male sterile side uh, in particular. 
we've crossed these experimental lines from our program to a male parent that we've licensed from private industry. So we'll have these uh, hybrid parent lines that we've developed in hybrid combination that we're testing for yield. We're testing for uh, oil content, of course, uh, as well as their, their stress tolerance, just to see how we're advancing in our hybrid parent line uh, development program here at K-State. So that's really interesting information. It's one of the things that I'm most excited about that our, our breeding program has been able to, to do over the last uh, five to ten years. Plenty of information to glean at the Norwich site. It's south of Norwich, and we'll tell you how to find out directions in a moment. 11 o'clock this Thursday morning. Then this Thursday afternoon at 3 o'clock, the second field day will be in far southern Sumner County, near Caldwell, you say. And similar program there? Yeah, very similar there. At the Caldwell site, we have two trials uh, from our breeding program. So materials that are kind of in that intermediate stage of development. Uh, one of the trials has strictly conventional materials in it. The other trial has strictly Roundup Ready material in it. We'll still talk about commercial varieties, of course, but then we'll kind of talk about what we're doing on the conventional side and what we're doing on the Roundup side. So uh, any of our new or potentially new commercial varieties that are Roundup Ready will be in that uh, trial, as well as in the conventional side, of course, will be uh, in the conventional trial. And so, again, we'll talk about those traits that are important to canola varieties for Kansas, winter hardiness, yield, and oil content primarily. And these field days are for current and prospective growers. Anybody who'd like to learn more about canola or get caught up on improvements in canola lines they should attend. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we welcome anybody to these field days, um, and we always have a range of guests, uh, farmers and extension agents and uh, those on the, the commercial side, input suppliers, seed suppliers, uh, end users even. We should have some people at the field days that might talk about uh, marketing options too as well, and I think that would be useful information. Always a good angle to cover there. Need one reserve their spot in advance for either of these field days, Mike? Yeah, for the Kingman field day, there is an RSVP date of May 11th. They're going to have a light lunch after the field day, so if you could call the extension office by uh, the end of the day on Wednesday, that would be great, so we could get a headcount for lunch. So note that needs to be in by tomorrow. Again, the first of the two field days on Thursday, the 12th, Kingman County, south of Norwich, 11 o'clock. The second will be in Sumner County, northwest of Caldwell, at 3 o'clock. The best thing to do is contact the respective extension offices in Kingman and Sumner counties, and they can fill you in on the exact directions of how to get there. Or you can refer to an article on these canola days, which was posted in the most recent Agronomy e-update newsletter at agronomy.ksu.edu. Mike, we wish you well with those events, and thanks for the overview of what's happening with canola in Kansas currently. Appreciate it, Eric. Thank you. Mike Stom is a canola agronomist with K-State Research and Extension. And we'll be back with more for you after this break over the K-State Radio Network. This is Agriculture Today. You're listening to Agriculture Today and standing by for another edition of Milk Lines. It's K-State Research and Extension Dairy Specialist, Mike Brook. Mike? Today I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy producers concerning the alfalfa crop. And this would actually uh, apply to those that raise alfalfa commercially here in the state. We do have some threats out there that you probably are aware of, but you really need to be diligent in trying to make sure that the insects do not move in and take over your crop. With the warmer temperatures that we've been experiencing and also the very strong southern winds, you really need to be vigilant about insects in your alfalfa crop. Keep in mind that the alfalfa may look great today from the road, but inside your alfalfa field you may be starting to get some insect populations that you need to address. Now, here's going to be the challenge. I encourage you to work with your agronomist to determine 
where the thresholds are, whether you should treat or not treat. Keeping in mind, if you need to come in and treat, it's going to delay your harvest. So sometimes we're better off harvesting and then treating after harvest to take care of residual insects if that's necessary. But I would expect that insect populations would explode rather rapidly this spring once we get to some warmer temperatures. And again, with the southern flow of air that we've had and the higher winds, these insects can advance hundreds of miles in a very short period of time. And in your growing crop, they can cause damage in just a matter of a couple of three days. So be vigilant. You probably need to be checking fields on a daily basis now to make sure that we're keeping track with where the insect populations are. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension. Thanks, Mike. And a bit of follow-up on that. Last Thursday, you'll recall, K-State crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth was Mike's side to update the alfalfa insect situation, alfalfa weevils, a primary concern, of course. And again, here's how he's advising you alfalfa growers about responding to that weevil activity. Generally, my treatment threshold in what we generally talk about is a third to a half infestation, which means if you have one larva per three stems or per two stems, that's what we're talking about. That's the treatment threshold. If you reach the treatment threshold, if your treatment threshold is 50%, I would go ahead and treat because it's not going to get less. It's just going to get more as we get more uh, warm temperatures. So those alfalfa weevil eggs are going to continue to hatch, plus that 50% that's already hatched and is already there is going to be feeding on a reduced amount of foliage, so they're going to be doing even more damage. Plus, with less foliage there, less canopy, you should get a better kill. The problem with that, and, and a lot of producers are understanding this, there's not as much foliage there to accept the spray. So if there's not a lot of foliage there to accept the spray, the, a lot of it will go on the ground or on the stems so that you won't get that residual control, whereas, you know, normally if it's 8 to 10 to 12 inches long, a nice canopy out there, you might get 10 to 14 days residual uh, as those eggs hatch and they start feeding on that growth. Now if, that, if a lot of the um, insecticide, a lot of the spray goes onto the ground, there's just not that much there, and as that plant puts out new new growth, it will not have any insecticide on it, but it is what it is. So they're going to be feeding, they're going to be laying eggs 24-7. And as a few more eggs hatch, once you hit that 50% uh, infestation level, you're still going to have a few eggs hatching. So you're going to get up to 100% pretty quickly. That's why I say even though you may not have as much foliage out there, as much canopy as you would like to accept some of the spray, I still think you're going to get a pretty good efficacy, a pretty good kill on the, the ones that are there and just go back and recheck and monitor again and see if there's any eggs hatching. K-State's Jeff Whitworth there on staying on top of alfalfa weevils as they might be at work in your alfalfa stands currently. And with that, our time's away once more. Thanks for tuning in. Please rejoin us right here tomorrow. Until then, Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.